We should be recording now. Okay, great. We are starting um, with the Federalist Papers today. Yes. Not the Anti-Federalists, but I will have a comment about that because apparently there are some extant Anti-Federalist writings out there, which I don't know, maybe we should have included. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, yeah, so two weeks on Federalist Papers and we're doing a, a, a sampling uh, each week, obviously not reading the whole thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, a, just a, a few things. The, so the Federalist Papers, these papers are actually being written, um, during the ratification process. So not the constitution's not finally ratified at this point, mm -hmm. um, which, um, meant that we are still in sort of the articles of confederation mode with delegates being sent. Uh, to Philadelphia to, um, well, write the Constitution, and then it goes back to the states to sort of debate it, as it were. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, so the, I, think, I think it's important to note that we, uh, 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 that with the Federalist Papers, um, all of the writers, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay, are in support of the U.S. Constitution, the proposed Constitution. Yes. And um, and obviously, they wouldn't be writing so many of these papers if there wasn't a reason. Um, so that means there was some resistance to, um, to the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, the... So, and, and those are what... Have ended up have ended up being called the anti-federalists. It should be noted the anti-federalists never referred to themselves as anti-federalists. Um, they would have been sort of like um, small R Republicans in the sense that each state that basically could, like sticking sticking more or less with the with the articles, right? So each state has representation mm -hmm. Republic, in uh, the Congress. But there isn't this new um, uh, tripartite form of government with, ex well, what they saw as excessive power from the executive um, and uh, the loss of state rights. So one thing you'll notice is, I'm not sure if all of them are, but a lot of them are addressed to the people of the state of New York. And New York was a holdout. Um, they were resisting um, the... Uh, uh, adoption of the of the Constitution. Okay. Um, the, I mean, basically, and actually, too, what what spurs them is to write it are um, is is a particular op ed that was written under the pseudonym of Cato. We don't have this in our book because they go by uh, Publius. Mm -hmm. um, they choose Publius as a contrast to Cato, because, both being uh, from um, Roman history, uh, political history, because uh, Cato, so the first sort of quote unquote anti federalist that says don't adopt this constitution, he is, they, they choose the name Cato um, uh, because he resisted. Um, Julius Caesar and this new form of government apparently actually committed suicide in light of this new government being formed, uh -huh. which was a lot of power within Julius Caesar. It was the end of the Republic and the start. It was a sort of transition period between the Republic and the um, Empire. So and Julius Caesar is pivotal there in bringing that about. Um, and uh, they had a Republican form of government. So as it were, much more representation, as it were, of the interests of the people. And that was being overthrown by Julius Caesar, and Cato kills himself in protest. So he goes under the pseudonym of Cato to argue against the adoption. And then this becomes a response, then, uh, all these Federalist Papers, to that. They take the name of Publius, uh, because Publius, Publius was also um, a historical individual that ended up um, helping overthrow the monarchy. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's sort of like, Hey, we don't, we don't want, you know, a monarchy. We don't want this sort of new form of government. 
So we, we don't have the anti-federalist arguments, but obviously we can discern them from what is said. Right. So were the, the pseudonyms papers. known at the time, or was that revealed later? Yeah, yeah. They were actually um, they were they were written under the pseudonym. They actually don't know who wrote the Cato one. They think it might have been like the governor of New York or some New Yorker. Okay. But um, the Publius one came out after or during? Uh, I think it came out during. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. I think, mm -hmm. I, I think it was, I, I think it came out during as, as sort of like a playful response. Um, yeah. And then the names come later. I mean, even if you look at Federalist Paper Number One, you've got Publius as the sign-off at the end of that paper. Right. Yep. I mean, it's the sign-off um, of, of a bunch the, of them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, so they weren't open about that it was like Alexander Hamilton or Jay. That right? I know of. That I know. Okay. Of. Um. So. Yeah, the big issue is just giving, uh, for the anti-federalists, is just giving too much power to the national government and therefore eliminating, eliminating uh, state rights or heavily reducing them. Mm -hmm. um, and why would you do that after we just fought this war to overthrow this massive monarchy? Um, I think we'll get this in next week but uh, with some of the papers, but one of their issues was just way too much power in the executive branch. Um, as sure. there, and, and recalling, there was no executive in the articles. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Shall we jump in? Yeah. Okay, so we did Federalist number one. Mm -hmm. What did you get from this? Uh, I think, what, was it both one and two? seem to be focused on arguments for the union and why it was mm -hmm. going to be beneficial mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. the union um, as opposed to like, you know, keeping all the states separate and in, in their own regards. Um, yeah. And I, I think too, uh, also within one, so obviously in a sense, they're all, they're all going to be arguing at some level for the union. Right. Um, as opposed to a confederacy among the states. And, um, but this one also in Federalist Number One is making the argument that this is a unique moment in political history as, um, as the people are actually reflecting upon and choosing their own government. So it's, it's, you know, it might be that this, you know, the anti-federalists have issues with, um, uh, the uh, the branches of government, the powers that are given to them. However, guess what? It really is within the hands of the people as they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. This is middle middle of first paragraph. Um, uh, so, yeah, well, well, let's see. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll just do the whole thing. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country to decide by their conduct and example, the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice. And or whether the opposition, they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to also be playing out like this is this is this is an important moment in our political history, because this actually is within the hands of the people, to, you know, to, to choose what kind of government they're going to have. Yeah. It's not coming from on high down, right? Um, uh, or accident, like, like, fine, you were born into this monarchy or something like that. Right. Um, in, in a sense, it's, it's a little bit like Plato sort of developing the utopia. You know, he's mm -hmm. having a conversation and sort of developing this, this out. Um, so I think that's notable as part of his argument, right? That this is... This is uh this is the decision of the people. Yeah, definitely. And at and at that time, um, you know, it's it's a lot fewer people than there are now. Yeah. So and I'm sure they all care they probably care more about the government structures because of the events surrounding that. Um yeah. like you know, it definitely is a unique time. Like you can't really just mm -hmm. say like, Oh, okay, well, now we're going to you we're going to change government you know people would there'd be a very different response nowadays 
um, yeah. to something that was like changing the constitution that much. Totally, totally. And I think there was some concern too from the anti-federalists about the possibility of amendment. I think they, they from what I recall, some of my readings, that they were, they just did not think it was going to be possible um, because there, it was such a high bar to meet mm. in order to amend, amend it. But of course, <clears throat> we know after the fact, at least on that point, they were wrong. Right. It has been right. yeah. 27 times. You know. mm -hmm. Trying to see what other. Um, there is an introductory element to this first paper. Yeah. I think what the second paper came out like a couple days after, four mm -hmm. days after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um,. I mean, it's sort of, you know, setting the options up uh, about this massive choice that we have to make. And and also, too, um, sort of like putting it like, like, I mean, now I find another instance. So we have accident and force. And then on page five, top of uh, foreign politics as in religion is equally absurd to aim at making proselyte lights by fire and sword. There's this element that we're, you know, this, this is not being forced upon you. We're going to be making like sound arguments, appealing to you know reason and logic, as we develop this. Mm -hmm. um, and we're and we're not going to do it by force. Uh, and then two, I'm seeing also on five. Uh, some of this language are here, paginations like, different uh they shouldn't be are, are you on page number one on page five for oh you said two i thought you meant federalist number two. Oh no five um bottom of about six lines up it says that the vigor of government is essential to, to the security of liberty i'm thinking vigor of government is sort of like power of government um um there's mention there too a little below about the rights of the people so there's there is sort of like you know this this uh the importance of the rights of the people and then firmness and efficiency of government that language all seems to to sort of speak to the idea that if we want these things we want this liberty we want these rights mm -hmm. that we have to have uh, a, a strong central government um which we can deal with um well, as we move through this at any point about to what extent do we think that that's true. Um, I mean, he, he does it again on six middle of, um, I'm clear middle. Yeah. I am clearly of, of opinion. It is your interest to adopt it. The new constitution. I am convinced that this is the safest course for your liberty, dignity, happiness. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, you know, certainly making making the the case, and and and, and it's I don't know. I, I mean, it's yeah, interesting to sort of like query whether or not you know that that follows, like right? whether or not the, the, to secure all of these rights, to secure you know this um, hard fought uh, liberty, whether or not this type of government slash a strong a centralized government is necessary for it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what's at the top of page six, he was kind of talking mm -hmm. about um, the diff like overthrowing republics, um, mm -hmm. begun their career paying the up, Obs obsequious, obsequious obsequious court of the people commencing demagogues and ending tyrants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think there's a concern uh, with other with other papers that we read that these tendencies within a regime may rear their head more in state governments right yeah so in other words like there's no there's who's the check to the governor yep. right who's the check to the, the leader, well, actually, it, it, I mean, the Federalists want it both ways. Um, at, seemingly, you get your state, you get your, you know, 
lowercase s sovereignty, you, um, I, I, you know, so th there's that element there, states' rights. And at the same point, you know, th a particular state cannot, um, uh, you know, rear itself out of control, leading to demagoguery or tyranny, because there's the safety net um, or uh, framing uh, or um, of, of, of what the governor can or can't do, right? Because the governor himself will have to be subservient to the Constitution. Mm hmm so I think there is that, um, I, I, that, that comes up, I, I forget which paper will probably cover it, where it comes up, where, where they deal with um, uh, war and strife yeah, between I think it was states. 10 right? or 31. Like that'll be held in check. Yeah. 10 is important, by the way. We, we do have to reserve a substantial time for 10. 10 is considered a classic mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the bunch we've read. Um, Uh, here's another thing too. On seven, toward the end, it was like we already hear it whispered in the private circles of those who oppose the new constitution that the thirteen states are to great extent for any general system, and that we must of necessity resort to separate confederacies of distinct proportions of the whole. So, as we talked about it before, we don't have we're not we're, in our reading we're not reading the anti-federalists, but we have obviously some of their response. Hey, it's just this is just too big, which is funny because we're talking about thirteen states versus fifty. I mean, the the anti federalists would have flipped, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Had there been fifty at the time, um, so yeah, it kind of it kind of shows the importance of having like hierarchy within the government, mm -hmm. um, because like you could just have one giant state over the whole U.S. and then you know there'd be the cities within it, but that's a lot of overhead to manage. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of exactly. kind of offloading the work and dividing it um, is helpful. And then they bring up the point where um, you know it's like there's you know there's differences between the states and who resides mm -hmm. in them. So mm -hmm. the the different states can and cities within those states can handle them accordingly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You're, you're yeah. You're you're sort of distributing the work of mm -hmm. the country, as it were. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting, too, that it seems like the, the Constitution then ends up, this is just a side thought that popped in my head, that the a Constitution ends up being somewhat of a compromise then between, um, between sort of, as it were, the interests of the monarchist and the interest of the Confederacy, right? Sure. Um, you know, uh, because it's... It's, it's, you know, I mean, it, it, it popped in my head because what you said is like, why not just have one? Why not just have one central government and no states? Fine, the states have borders or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, you, if, you want, if you want to distinguish them, but there's not like a, a, a specific state government that's running it. You know, and I think probably, um, well, maybe even the Federalists would, would say this too, but the Anti-Federalists would say, you've got to be crazy. I mean, that's going to be no different than, a, it's going to be no, I mean, it's going to be, how is that any different than Britain, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a king that's powerful in this sort of advisory parliament. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's a lot of centralized power as, a, as opposed to, you know, sort of distributed. However, though, it does seem that th things would work with a little bit more efficiency. Um, as we talked about when we talked about uh, Hobbes and whether or not it would be a group, a few people, or one. Right. Mm -hmm. so you are going to have to debate and so on and so forth and one makes a decision and it happens um, and that's obviously an ongoing um, criticism of the US government um, and other constitutional governments where it's just it, it, it's so slow yeah. the process is ridiculously slow you know um, you know to get good work done um, how about two? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh, was this, wait, the natural rights? I feel, uh, this was kind of going off of, of what the people have right to. Mm-hmm. Um... 
Yeah, actually, you're right. This uh, second paragraph, I guess, yeah. Starts off with this uh, um, Hobbesian, Lockean notion about yeah. natural rights and having to cede some of those rights to the government. Yeah. Um, so that we've got that background there. Um, and... I feel like this kind of um, more so addresses what we were just talking about uh, mm -hmm. with like where those rights are ceded to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's doing exactly. And he's doing sort of this, you know, compare and contrast between one nation and separate confederacies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously arguing that um, whatever, you know, safety and happiness will result in a, in a union will not result ultimately in, or division is going to result in confederacies or, or sovereignties. Um, but the argument is always sort of interesting, right? Not just the conclusion. Oh, yeah, this was interesting. Some of his arguments are on page nine. So in other words, like why, right? We have the, we have the conclusion, right. which is this whole notion of uh, whatever, more happiness in the union, more division in the states, but why? What, I thought well, this one was sort of interesting. Uh, top of nine, he's like a succession of navigable waters forms a kind of chain round its borders as if to bind it together. Which is sort of interesting, sort of like, hey, look at the natural, the natural environment even argues for the union. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one below uh, we are already sort of a united people I'm paraphrasing and why because we are a people descended from the same ancestors speaking the same language professing the same religion attached to the same principles of government similar in manners and customs I mean, these are part of the the, the premises mm -hmm. here, right um, uh so, oh, and not only that, let's, let, let's, let's like hit at home here. We fought on the same side. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I have to be honest, those are interesting reasons. They might not be the best, right? Cause you can still be sort of, you can still be united through a confederacy. Mm -hmm. It would be a different kind of union, but we, you'd still be somewhat united. Right. Yeah. So um, it kind of sounds like he's arguing for, or, or at least with these points, like the united um being united at the personhood level not at the state mm -hmm. government level right since sure. we're talking about human rights and like life liberty and pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. you know that's kind of what it sounds like it's talking about it's like right um establishing that these people that all the people within the nation have the equal pleasure and right um to these things and that's what they fought for and mm -hmm. it's not about it's not about like having differences in that or about you know how the states manage it but that those are the basic things that the people fought for right exactly and and and, and appealing to that yeah right mm -hmm. we, we have been you know we're united by land we're united by all of these other cultural pieces and our history ergo we should be truly united um yeah i think what you, you, i don't you know, know if you pay, paraphrase this part but the second to last paragraph on page nine is like as a nation mm -hmm. we have made peace and war as a nation we have vanquished oh, yeah, our common yeah. enemies uh there you have go. formed alliances made treaties and entered into various compacts yeah the, the, i i underlined the, the rhetoric of as a nation repeated mm -hmm. three times right to yeah. really sort of you know stick at home but again i i don't know that i mean it's gonna have to be some other components that really seal it for me because those, those you know the, you I can be united as a people and a history in either the Confederacy or the Constitution. Do, do you know? Yeah, no, I agree. Because um, the Articles of the Articles of Confederation have a Congress that has representation for a certain number of um, you know legislative priorities, and the rest is left up to the states. That's still a type of you know. It's yeah, still this type is of unification. this is definitely rhetoric here. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, 
I'm trying to remember, did he did he also bring up some of the the logic that like Hobbs and Locke had um You know, for like the I, natural I, I rights. Remember that at the well, I, that was a, was that, oh wasn't that toward the beginning, right? I guess he did. Yeah, I guess it yeah. was towards the beginning. On eight, on eight, top of nothing is more certain than the indispensable necessity of government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The people must cede to it some of their natural rights in order to vest it with requisite powers. It's sort of like yeah, um, whatever. Uh, going way back to lay the foundation of uh, why we enter into a social contract uh, to begin with. Yeah, but I guess um, that doesn't have anything to do with the union. Yeah, I mean, exactly, because that, that would still apply to the articles yeah. as, a type of con as a type of contract. Mm -hmm. um, six was next. Yeah, next. I, I just wanted to say on, on oh, two, go for it, at the end, um, <laughs> he says, like, at, oh, on page 10, he's like, uh, admit, uh, for so is the fact that this plan is only recommended, not imposed. Um, right. Yeah, let yeah, it be remembered the, that like, it is I'm... neither recommended to blind approbation nor blind reprobation. So, so. It's, it, it, you've got sort of this element of, um, going back to what we said earlier in the first one, this is what the rational person can evaluate, right? This is not being forced upon you. Yeah. You know. Um, and it's probably, you know, it probably accepts error or subject to change. Um, right, which, which, yeah. I mean, it's kind of built into it with amendments um, being allowed. Exactly. Exactly. But I think that that hurdle, well, the hurdle of the articles was ridiculous, right? That was, yeah, that was 100% agreement among the 13 colonies. Yeah. To, to amend it, you know, so at least the Constitution didn't have that high of a bar, <laughs> you know, but I do think that just from some of my other reading that that was a concern mm -hmm. that even trying to amend it uh, with your two thirds majority and um, I think, isn't it? I wonder if it's two thirds across the board, two thirds in the Congress and then two thirds among the states because it goes back to the states as well. Dang it, we just read the Constitution. <laughs> Should remember this stuff. Um, so in six, then we get um, sort of this analogy to uh, nations, right? Uh, and foreign nations. And what's going to happen if it's one nation up against another nation and they're not united in, in you know, as a people? Right. Um, right. So, <clears throat> um, so essentially, uh, if you the basic argument works this way, if you hold on to the Articles of Confederation or some other constitution um, where the states retain their sovereignty, then this is going to lead into um, this is going to lead into strife between the states, and uh, and basically, you know, just um just run with all of the negative things that can come from said strife right mm -hmm. um every, everyone's going to be protecting their borders i mean it's basically taking sort of an inter intra national argument down to the level of the states right this big thing that we just this massive conflict that we just had with uh great britain how is we're going to have the same thing if we hold on to the states, everyone's got their own governor, everyone's got their own militia, and there will be rivalries, and that will lead to to war. Mm -hmm. right? And it is sort of interesting, they wouldn't have known this at the time, but they have, I mean, he comes up with his own arguments in this one, right? Uh, Pericles, um, uh, arguments from Britain, I mean, he, he, he like, he runs through them. But it is sort of, it made me think of the uh, Second World War, right? Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got this relatively small uh, continental piece of Europe, and you have Germany attacking Poland, and Germany moving into France. You know, those are all close. <laughs> um, 
under a union could have that could could that have been um, prevented you know right um, yeah um, i mean it, uh, when you yeah. talk about like the national level it's it's it gets so hairy because we, you know, you, you'd mentioned before, it's like, um, kind of the checks and balances between the governors and the states and then the states and the federal government, right? Like you kind of want to have the, them going both directions, you know, towards the people and then up in the hierarchy. But at some point the hierarchy has to stop. <laughs> yeah. Like at the national yeah. level, we've got just a bunch of different states that are, um, you know, they've got their own territory, their own people. And then they're figuring it out between the other, you know, nation states. And it's not like there's an overarching government above them. Like there's the unions between them, but those are even different in themselves. So, man, like when you get that many people, it becomes a lot harder to manage, um, which... Although, what? what's interesting is that when we get to 10, um, I think it's Hamilton, is going to make the argument that the constitution his whole argument is about factions and he's going to argue and he's going to argue basically that the that by having this larger union and we'll have to look at the details of this by having this larger union that will actually prevent more factions from arising yeah that's true so you this larger i mean that's at least what he says right um and we'll have to we'll have to pick that apart because he, that was the whole argument where he plays up sort of the minority uh, versus the uh, minority uh, faction versus a majority faction. Mm -hmm. um, and that the larger style of union um, can quell that. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I get it with you. And I forget who, what's it, was, was it Aristotle? Um, yeah, I think it was Aristotle where his, his model was not, was more along the lines of a smaller city state aka size of Rhode Island, that you could actually do a proper regime, at least as he sees it, to bring about, you know, human flourishing and virtuous activity. So it had to be small. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, and not only that, the West hasn't been explored here in the 1780s, right? So there's not a full grasp of how really large this country could potentially be right. That's true. You know, um, meaning I'm, I'm sort of playing, playing, playing at it from the perspective of those living during the time of these debates that if 13 seemed large, right. Uh, 50 would have been crazy, like mm -hmm. absurd. Um, or, and, and they're just thinking of that small sort of Eastern slice mostly of, um, of whatever North of America. Um, so, so basically the argument here, the argument here is basically saying that, I mean, you've got things like, you know, state of disunion, uh, competition, domestic, uh, factions, uh, frequent and violent contest with each other. And it's, but what, but why? I mean, well, part of this is just the nature <laughs> of human beings, mm -hmm. but, but, but obviously he's wrapping it into an argument against uh, a collection of states, right? Right, so um, against a full republic. Right. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, see, it's, it's, it's sort of like, just to sort of get into his thinking here, like, what, what how does the size argument fit into, fit, you know, fit into, um, the, the the constitution and the union as being a preventative you know and, and i guess i guess i guess my best sense of it is going to be what we've already said that you're basically having a lot of small nations touching each other you know on, on their borders and because there's no united sense that 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 uh that, that um Virginians and, and Marylanders are a people that that could lead to everything he's describing, right? Yeah. I, right? Mean... I mean, it's sort, sort of like, I, I'm like, I'm in California, you're in Maryland, but there's still a sense that we are Americans mm -hmm. um, distinct from 
Canadians distinct from Mexicans that touch our border, right? Um, so, you know, there, there, there is somewhat of an argument there, but I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm not articulating it well, but I'm, I'm struggling to find what size, in a sense, has to do with, uh, and maybe it's not even size, but um, I don't know. I guess the, the, the notion of united versus uh, I don't want to say divided, <laughs> but separate the collection of states separate, right? Yeah. It has to do with the argument. So, I mean, he brings up war a little bit here, but I mean, we're going to be talking about that more, but yeah. one, and we've also talked about how slow government is. And I think yeah. in the case of the pure Republic or under the original articles, um, it was kind of slow, right? Like there yeah. were, there were some mentions as to how war would be dealt with, like, the state shouldn't engage in war or initiate mm -hmm. war individually, but if they were to respond to it, then, you know, they would, they would respond themselves and then bring it to uh, the Confederation and then all of them would respond accordingly. But that seems like a slow process. Like if, yeah. if you do have a union between the states, then the response to external threat becomes a lot quicker. Um, yeah. Because if you have like the executive branch, you know, kind of managing that, then it doesn't have to just go through, the Republic or through, um, you know, the agreements between a bunch of states to make that decision. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that decision can be made through a more focused unit, I guess. Um, and then out, you know, pool the resources from the states to respond. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, okay, one state, one state is being attacked or whatever, war is being waged, and then they're going to do their best job and then try to rally up the other states to also respond. So right. there is definitely more unity in in response to to war, and I'm sure that could apply to other things like um, if we're talking about like the judicial branch. If if similar problems are happening in different parts of you know the different states, um, they don't have to deal with those issues entirely separately um, at the legislative or judicial levels. Um, there there's some sort of unity between uh what you know what what is standard between the states yeah i i, I think i i totally yeah the, the, i think i could see the efficiency argument um you can also see i guess the i guess the other element is this that you and the, as you're talking this dawned on me that not only so so with your point about responding to a threat mm -hmm. Um, there's efficiency because there's one centralized uh, sort of authority that can respond as opposed to 13. Yeah, and it's their job. It's not like they have to wait for a time to meet. Right, right. correct, correct. A prerogative. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing did, I guess I could sort of, sort of understand this. Like he says at the end of this article, he says um, he's quoting a quote unquote intelligent writer. Neighboring nations, says he, are naturally enemies of each other unless their common weakness forces them to league in a confederate republic, and their constitution prevents the differences that neighborhood occasions, uh, extinguishing the secret jealousy which disposes all states to, to aggrandize themselves at the expense of their neighbors. So there are two things come to mind here. One is that by having separate states, your loyalty, as he sees it, really becomes more towards your state than the Confederacy, mm -hmm. or, 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 or the, yeah, the, the weak union, let's call it, under the Articles. Um, so that's that's one element. You are you are. It's, 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 let's put it this way. It's I don't have this. I don't think you have this. But people do have this. Um, uh, you know, massive Baltimore Ravens fan versus massive. Pittsburgh Steelers fan, right? Mm -hmm. you know, you, there is this loyalty to, to, to team and state, as it were, in that battle. And I'm guessing what he's, what, in a sense, this is a, a larger problem than team sports, where your loyalty is within your state, you want to defend it, and all these other like elements arise in terms of like um, comparing yourself to the other state, uh, you know, competition, it does bring up actually commercial competition as well, mm -hmm. but it does make sense at, at this level to me that if you erase that and you're not putting sort of a 
lowercase as sovereignty within the states that you, you you are actually eliminating the potential of all 13 colonies fighting against each other the civil war notwithstanding as right. it comes in the 1800s but that 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 does sort of make sense right i mean you know other than the civil war i mean you just it's in, in whatever in the 1900s you're not finding that california is taking up arms against oregon you know mm -hmm. um and because there is this sort of not only a constitutional notion of union but also and, I, and he hits some of these but a psychological sense of union right this is this is part of my identity as an american oh my goodness you're an american too you know what's the point of fighting against each other like that to me like that to me sort of clicks a little bit um the the notion that you know if you, if you are your own sovereignty then you're gonna have to carry the weight of an attack not just against a foreigner from another nation but also against another state mm -hmm. and it could be the case that they might want you know your property your goods um you know or if they if they attack you have to respond in kind that stuff's just eliminated so i i, I I think out of what's at least in my thinking, at least in part of, from what they've said and are in discussion, that that makes sense. How, how does that sit with you? No, I think that definitely makes sense. Um, it's definitely a different kind of argument. Like that's not like as logical, maybe, or um, it's because it's going off of like you know so so sociology and psychology it's not as mm -hmm. like firm in the logic um when it comes yeah. to like okay well if we're talking about social contracts it's very logical like how those sure. you know come about um this is definitely more rhetoric more an appeal to the people um mm -hmm. but it definitely with you know coming from good intentions and i think it's responding to 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 things well um and of course we have you know, we have the history played out in our side of the coin, so we can observe the right. effects of this. And it's harder to see what it would have been like otherwise. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, the only real big issue would be the Civil War. You know, right? What, but was not even that, that would be more factions, right? Not states so much. Well, that that would be regions, right? North, South. Sure, but um, I think that would be reasons. the context is a bit different. Like, like the Civil War is, is about um, addressing a conflict, you know, in the in you know in the within structure of the, the government union. within the union, and I'm you know there's certain circumstances that caused it to to go about in that direction, <clears throat> but um, it's almost like the union allows for that to a degree mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. granted it, we're we're glad that it's only happened once <laughs> um, right but it was necessary for it to happen yeah and and it's and, and as most of it is related to the issue of slavery yeah i don't want to say all of it but as most of it is you've got a piece in here you have a piece in here that um in uh in six hamilton's just not addressing right because yeah. the, the, the the institution of slavery like that's mm -hmm. just I mean, his his more his argument is more uh states are going to uh, uh have 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 jealousies and divisions and contests etc um that's and, and literally because they are separate states they are separate little nations right mm -hmm. um but that's not factoring in something like the institution of slavery, where you have uh, rising abolitionists, um, you have the slaves themselves that want to be emancipated, um, and other political um, tensions at play. Possibly also regional ones that, that might not be, you know, that may be more akin to what he's saying, right? North versus South, not just on slavery, but maybe also culturally. Um, so, yeah, that would be, I mean, the, the the, the way that it's um, counters a federal argument is that it happened. <laughs> yeah. Right. 
Soviet Union is, is, is going to dissolve all this, this possibility. No, not in the mid 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many differences as well, right? From, from, from what's being said, because the, the strife, uh, you know, is caused by an institution that all of these guys mostly from what we know, um, had embraced. Mm -hmm. Now, for sake of time, I say we skip nine and focus on 10. Sure. Nine might be good. <laughs> um, but as 10 is sort of considered a classic of these papers, it might uh, do us well to, to uh, focus in on it. So this is basically topic factions. Yes. Um, and um, well, we start with it. Among the numerous advantages proposed by a well-constructed union, none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. Um, so I think faction, it might be good to maybe sort of when you read this, how were you understanding a faction? Um, I mean, I think it's a group of people that have the same, like, uh, alliances. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think it's necessarily restricted to being a state or a city. You know, it's just, it's an arbitrary group of people within the government. Um, yeah probably opposing something otherwise like some, there's something that distinguishes them yes. from, from the yes. government totally yes exactly i think there's a dissenting element mm -hmm. within a faction right? yeah and it and, and 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 a faction could be uh could, could run the gamut from uh peaceful to violent sure um so <laughs> in a sense the revolutionaries were a faction mm -hmm. um so the focus then is on this, the problem of factions. And then in our minds, then we need to be dealing with union versus states in uh, addressing the problem of factions. Right. Um, he does mention in this uh, section, well, I'm sorry, he even defines faction on 54. By a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens mm -hmm. or the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Okay. So this could be a minority, but it seems like a faction could also be a majority, right? It's right. still a group. It's still a grouping. Um, and which is so a lot that's... harder to deal with a majority faction. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Yeah. So, um, so let's just, for sake of argument, let's say that, that, that obviously if you're in the faction, you think you don't have a problem with this, right? You think you're doing the right thing. Yeah. So let's just, for sake of argument, assume the faction's in the wrong just to get his thinking. Yes. So he, he breaks it down then by saying two methods of curing this. One is by removing its causes and the other by controlling its effects. Mm -hmm. And when he does causes, uh, he breaks those down as well. Uh, you can destroy the liberty, which is essential to the faction's existence, mm -hmm. right? Hey, they are free to dissent. Um, and the other, this was interesting, the other by giving to every citizen the same opinion, the same passion, the same <laughs> This interest. was very interesting. It's like... Right. Whoa. So I mean, yeah. if you look at it, um, why am I forgetting the name, the general name? What was the what was the amendment that was repealed? Uh, prohibition. Prohibition. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, like prohibition, um, destroying the liberty to which is essential to, to its existence. Right. So now you're no longer right. free to do those things. Right. That would be an example of, of that in action. I don't right. think we. I don't think. In our government, we've ever seen the latter. I could be wrong. I no. mean, uh, no. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, you 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 could see this in other governments where, uh, you know, they're very forceful over like information or 
how right. things are are distributed to people. It, it almost seems like by this one, it's like it says by giving to every citizen, and I'm wondering if that's if if that's a weak way of saying indoctrinating. Yeah, or forcing. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, liberty is out. Removing liberty is out. Right. Why is it out? Because, well, he he says it. He's like, um, it, it it's essential to the political life. So oh, in other yeah. words, liberty is a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So in yes. other words, the liberty with which this group, ha and I guess this actually connects without him knowing it, to like First Amendment rights. So you get rid of that, you're stabbing yourself, you know, in the foot, right? Because the uh, liberty is is, uh, let's put it this way, bedrock for American political thought, constitutional thought, that part of the spirit of an American, right? Yeah. So, um, maybe it comes up with a, a nice little analogy. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an ailment without which it initially expires. Yes. It instantly expires. So you, you, you cut away at, you know, liberty here, you're cutting away at liberty in general. Um, and then, and then he makes about the second cause, this whole idea of, everyone whatever you know forcing everyone to think the same thing or act the same way is his counter to that on 55 is a, it's a diversity one that is to say the, the so in other words if everyone's thinking the same thing yeah fine you deal with the cause of the faction but at the same point you lose something and what you lose is quote the diversity in the faculties of men from which the rights of property originate um, is not less an insuperable obstacle to an, a, a, to an un, huh, uniformity of interests. So the protection of these diverse faculties is the first object of government. Mm -hmm. So, right. So in other words, uh, you, you know, you can't force everyone to think the same way because guess what? This diversity is also essential to uh it it, it it ought to be protected yeah right mm -hmm. which 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 makes me think of like diversity within religion mm -hmm. and other dif different types of diversities you know ethnic so on and so forth mm -hmm. that are protected you know so that was interesting i, I actually sort of like the way this guy argues yeah. breaking it down right? definitely um who was this again uh hamilton again uh, no this is madison oh madison i'm sorry is it okay right yeah Yes, yep, you're right, you're right. Um, now, he gets... I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I mean, there, there's some other good points he makes. But on 57, he then gets to the effect piece. So the inference to which we are brought is that, that the causes of faction, middle of, sorry, cannot be removed, and that relief is only to be sought in the means of controlling its effects. Yes. We should probably understand what he means by that. I understand the difference between causes and effects, but what would be the effects of a faction? Or how do you control the effects? Well, no, what are the effects just generally? Uh, I mean, it sounds... Because he's... Hmm. So it sounds like, I mean, causes are what, what makes the faction what it is, right? Liberty so it's freedoms and, opinion. and it's opinions. Yeah. Yeah. And an effect sounds like what it is outputting into the world. The political right? Like world, what is it changing? Right. right. So um, by being, yeah, by, by having a faction and, and by the way, it seems like the effects could be multiple and a, and a range of them. Yeah. Uh, again, from something as benign as letting them state the opinion ultimately to violence and insurrection. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so, if we take the example of prohibition, like if if you if you were to consider that a faction of people, then what would the effects be? Um, it's like the people people who are drinking, consuming, um, right. you know, those kinds of things. Um, the effects that they have on the world would, uh, I guess, the ration sure. like you know sure. the rationale so, yeah. would be behind what they're, you know, what they're causing to other people's freedoms. Right. Um, 
so no no it, it, absolutely right i mean and you could sort of even oh you cut out i think your battery died Sorry. It's okay. Um, so I was saying you could look at the effects of allowing it by saying that you know, public drunkenness, the breakdown of the family, um, money being wasted, you know, on uh, uh, consumption of alcohol, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So basically by controlling the effect, right, you remove that possibility, although whenever you remove that possibility by a law, if it's something people want and drugs have been around for a very long time mm -hmm. of various sorts, then you get an underground, right? Yeah. Um, response to it. And that in itself um, kind of creates a, a stronger faction, if you, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Now it is interesting right after the effects comment on 57, he says if a faction consists of less than a majority. Okay. So a minority, Relief is supplied by the Republican principles of representation, mm -hmm. which enables the majority to defeat its sinister views by regular vote. Mm -hmm. So let's tease that out. So you've got a, you know, uh, see here, here I'm thinking of, when I'm thinking of a minority, do they have political power? Like, is this like, I don't know, work with me, the attack on the Capitol type thing. I mean, is this... Uh, I mean, what? They're talking less than 60%, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it could be anything. It could be, right. it could be so a small, question... it could be a small representative in the government, like, it could be one state, it could be, right. you know, a couple states, it could be less than a state, but yeah, small, sure. a small number. So what is repu re what is what is representational government, which is what's meant by the Republican principle? What does that do to su to um, uh, sorry supply relief? Uh, like if we were going to go with uh, the articles as is. Well, no, he's going to be. Uh, well, he's arguing for the constitution obviously right but he but i'm just sort of thinking out in other words so i'm trying to think of a good example maybe that's not prohibition for some reason but you've sure. got a faction you've got a faction that's trying to do something that's against the spirit of the government within a regime mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a minority then representation allows the majority to defeat it by a regular vote um Maybe, I don't know, maybe the introduction of a policy is good. Um, God. Um, we need to know our legal history better. Um, <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking like, um, oh, I don't know. God. Let's say you have a faction. I'm, I'm trying, like, may, may, this might be a good example or not, but let's say uh, the, the vote counting in the 2020 election. So there were a lot of people that were buying into the idea that it was an unfair election mm -hmm. and they're hitting up the states and they're hitting up senators and they're hitting up representatives to pursue it in some particular way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, um, then a majority of representatives, um, I guess with wisdom and insight, can make a decision as to whether or not to respect that. So for instance, actually, this is not a bad example. On the day of the insurrection, that's when they were counting the electoral votes, and, which is supposed to be apparently just very perfunctory. They open up the envelopes, they count the votes, and then they state that uh, the winner won. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, so however, though, there was talk leading into that, 
about how th this was either unconstitutional or this was not uh, fair because there were irregularities in, uh, in, in the voting. Well, they essentially, th that was voted down, that they should, I, I'm sorry, what specifically? This, the specific recommendation from a few of the senators with that was that they do basically give like a 10 to 14 day period to do a recount, okay? Sure. It's basically to do further investigation, right? So you've got the faction that as it were, it's holding up that the election was unfair. It goes to the level of the uh, Senate. It's a minority in the Senate. It's a majority that's, it's a minority that wants to propose it. It's the majority that ends up um, uh, voting against it. Mm -hmm. So I guess that might be an example. Sure. Um... When a majority is included in a faction, oh, this is now the majority form few lines down when a yep. majority is included in a faction the form of popular government on the other hand enables it to sacrifice to its ruling passion or interest both the public good and the rights of other citizens is included in the faction okay so this is just when the majority basically there's going to be more harm done <laughs> yeah but how do you quell it how do you how do you how do you respond to it because he first starts off by saying by setting up with a minority fa faction does he address the majority faction um i think he does I, I, at the bottom of 57 he's like opening up to it he's like what, uh, but uh, but what means or by what means is this object attainable yeah Evidently, by one or one of two only, either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the same time must be prevented, or the majority having such coexistent passion um, or interest must be rendered by their number and local situation unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. Wow. Hmm. All right, that's all on you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have a majority faction. A lot of people are dissenting something. <laughs> passion of interest in a majority, the same time must be prevented. So it's the faction that does not have the interest of the people right. or of the government, I guess. Um, or the majority having such coexisting, uh, coexistent passion or interest must be rendered by their number and local situation, unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. So, number and local situation, unable to concert and carry into effect schemes and, of oppression. And also, is, is it the case that in this sentence we've got a, f the first sentence, is, or the second sentence, the either, right? The existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the same time must be prevented. Mm-hmm. So the so so I guess that goes without saying. It's a faction you want to prevent it, but you know, or the majority having such coexistent passion or interest must be rendered by their number and local situation unable. To, so you, you just cut yeah. out. Are yeah. You Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I okay. just I, I I'm trying to make sense of that. Uh, yeah. So it sounds like, um, wait, either the existence of the same passion or interest in the majority. So preventing either of those things. Um, the majority having such coexisting passion must be rendered. So it's how to respond to a majority that has that passion or interest. Mm -hmm. um, it must be re rendered unable to, to carry out its schemes of, or oppression, of oppression. Um, the by number and local situation is interesting. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, maybe this, that's I, I, how I'm it's looking... being responded to. Mm -hmm. Like, like, um, you can render it unable by number or by local, by number and by local situation. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you can overcome the majority by number, 
or you can overcome them by local situations. So I'm guessing smaller efforts that are spread around. Spread around. Context here, Christian, is that it leads into a distinction between democracy and a republic. Right. Um, like, like, and, and and the language of uh, the majority is con- is, is is and and concert is carried over. So I, I feel like there is a bit of like, in other words, he's not addressing form of government in this context. I think he's still, he, in other words, he's still. The argument is very abstract. Um, and, and, uh, and open in terms for both the min- minority point, well, let's put it this way, cause and effect, minority and majority, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's very open with what form of government. Um, and because he segues into into the idea that a democracy, yeah, he pits these two against each other. And I think that a pure democracy, which he mentions on the top of 58, yep. is, is, is a problem. Because the you're, basically you're going to have uh, as it were, a type of mob rule if it's a majority faction, but within a pure democracy. Yeah, can admit so, it, for it, no it, cure it, for the mischiefs mischiefs of a of a faction. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, I think that you can't. We can't assume a type of government. He's not assuming a type of government in the earlier part of this with right. cause, effect, and majority, minority. Just sort of in general, how do you take care of these things? Yeah, uh, either by number or by local situation. Right. Um, I mean, he says at the bottom of 58, he's like a, a republic, by which I mean a government in which the scheme of representation takes place, opens a different prospect and promises the cure for which we are seeking. Um, let us examine the points in which it varies from pure democracy, and we shall um, comprehend both the nature and cure, or nature of the cure, and the efficacy which it must derive from the union. Uh, continuing, the two great points of difference between a democracy and a republic are first, the delegation of the government in the latter to a small number of citizens elected by the rest. Secondly, the greater number of citizens and greater sphere of country over which the latter may be ex- extended. Um, so, the I, I think the way to deal with the, yeah, I mean, like I said before, um, Hey, which, which, if we want to if we want to deal with the problem of a majority faction, which type of government are you going to choose? A pure democracy means that the undesired majority faction will end up winning. Right, no matter what, pretty much. Exactly. The republic, however, is a safeguard against that. Which, by the way, is sort of interesting because it's it's a the argument seems to be it's a it's a it's an internal check to factions yes right mm-hmm. and i think all these guys are sort of thinking at the time and even in some of the the writings that we've we've read about uh the, these um, american documents that um not just any idiot's going to be a, a representative a senator or executive mm-hmm. or judiciary there is right? an expectation of wisdom Yes. So, so in other words, you've got the faction that's arising. Um, it's a majority faction. Um, issues get to you know issues get to the um, uh, the Congress um, about how to deal with the faction, and even if some of the members are convinced, if if not all of them are, or I'm sorry, if it's a minority, then. Uh, the representative form of government will win out over the democracy because of its structure. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an internal check. Yeah. Um, So there's a couple things that are interesting about that. Right. Um, So with pure democracy, you're pretty much just taking, you're taking the vote as is Um, mm -hmm. it, you get that mob rule with the Republic. You're kind of putting it through a filter. So Mm -hmm. If your majority faction has representation in the Republic as a majority as well, then it's going to be the same issue. Um, But I think more importantly, because the Republic is kind of like a longer lasting position, right? Like the people who are representatives are in those positions for longer periods of time, as opposed to like the opinions of people and the number of people, which is constantly changing. 
um, mm -hmm. there's kind of like that that long term effect uh, of it and the process of oh uh, you know of what the I guess kind of the requirements for wisdom quote unquote. Um, mm -hmm. Like, there's no actual requirement for the wisdom of a person who's being a representative. It's kind of sure. like an abstract thing that's that that allows them to be voted into that position or th or things that they've done for the community. So mm -hmm. it's kind of assuming that those structures will benefit um, as putting them into the position to be part of that filter. Right. What's interesting, too, along with that, I mean, I like your notion of the filter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even he even he even has a version of that. So un, uh, four lines, four or five lines down from the top of 59, um, under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves. So it is this it's, you know, it's it's still the public voice because you voted these people into office. Mm -hmm. Right. And they are, their, their function is representative, right? Um, but it's, it's almost, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like the public voice has gone through this filter of reason, reflection, and experience, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it's throwing some pragmatism um, in terms of like how this will, you know, how, how this will play out. Um, what what it does interest me though is this is all along the lines of the argument for the union versus the states. So, um, right, is it the case? Is it the case then that he's assuming that if the, uh, the Articles of Confederation hold and the states still have their their rights and their quote unquote sovereignty that the, the, this pure democracy, well, it's not really, well, I don't know, it's, it, it leans more toward the democratic problems than it does toward the Republican solutions. Right. What was the, yeah. um, in the Articles of Confederation, what was the the legislative, um, like, did they each get like one, rep, like three representatives or something? It was or something like was it proportional like to the, to I the don't, state size? I don't, I don't know if it was proportional, um... So maybe that kind of uh, well, I don't know. The idea of having you know the House of Representatives and the Senate um, in the Constitution kind mm -hmm. of address this republic uh, better than previously. Uh, the Congress. So I'm looking back. Article five of the Articles of Confederation creates the Congress of the Confederation. Each states. I'm sorry, each state gets one vote in the Congress mm -hmm. and can send between two and seven people to participate, but still each state gets one vote. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's... This is... Uh, Let's jump to 60, it's sort of as we conclude. Um, I mean, this is a, a bit of a middle of an argument. He is talking about uh, representatives. Mm, number of electors right. and number, like, kind yes, of how like, big your filter is, basically. Yes, exactly. And so the top is like, it must be confessed that in this, in most other cases, there is a mean on both sides of which inconveniences will be found to lie. By enlarging too much the number of electors, you render the representative too little acquainted with all their local circumstances and lesser interests. As by opposite, reducing it too much, you render him unduly attached to these and too little fit to comprehend and pursue great and national objects. And this is the part I wanted to get to. The federal constitution forms a happy combination in this respect. The great and aggregate interests being referred to the national, the local and the particular to the state legislatures. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the this is still the, the 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 argument of we are not erasing your state rights. We are not erasing your state power. Right. Um, you know, um you cut out again 
No, no, no. Yep. I'm sorry. I, I I cut out in thought and therefore in language and uh. speech rather. Um. Yeah, just sort of taking in the uh, some of this. Yeah, no. It, it, there, there's more there, but we should probably give it a close. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but that one's good. We probably should have started with that one. <laughs> yeah, probably. That <laughs> was the one that was most memorable. Yeah, most memorable, and then also the. Um, I feel like sometimes it's a barrage of words, and it's hard to find the structure. Sure. Uh, in, in some of the papers, and this one was very well structured. Mm -hmm. Like in other words, it's like he's like giving you. You could almost like sort of see the premises and the conclusions to analyze. Yeah. So, all right, good. We'll stop there. Sounds good.